So hello Pierre, this hello, is actually hello. my first in-person recording so I'm super excited and I'm so happy that it's actually with you <laughs> because you know you've been making so many waves in this whole domain of uh, compostable packaging and packaging overall I think. So thank you so much for agreeing to this and thank you for making it in person. Yeah, no worries, my pleasure. <laughs> Great, so we're going to start with things we don't know about you which is, <laughs> tell us about your growing up years and you've become such a force in this whole ecological domain. What are the things when you were growing up that influenced you in your thinking so that, you know, you are where you are now? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think I was always, um, uh, I always thought that I would be an inventor and like uh, being a kid, uh, often my, my, my parents and my grandma were kind of like encouraging me to kind of like uh, pursue some slightly crazy little inventions and so on. So there was always a, a curiosity that I think my parents kind of like really supported. Um, and so when it came to choosing a, kind of like a, like a education, I was really hesitating between um, a more kind of like technical uh, training in engineering and a more artistic one in, in, in art or design. Uh, because there is a bit of intersection of these two things when, when it comes to creating something new. And under some really good advice, I actually kind of like pursued a, an engineering de degree first, um, which was tough because like it's very structured, there's a bit of a, like a siloed way of, of doing things. Uh, but I think that was really good for like the foundations, understanding kind of like uh, how uh, materials and mechanics and all sorts of different kind of like uh, scientific princ principles work. And from there, after actually a couple of years working as a packaging engineer for L'Oreal, making lots of plastic uh, cream jars and shampoo bottles and so on, um, I actually kind of like got a chance of jumping again back into studying more this time on like the, the design thinking and the art side of things at the Royal College of Art and, and Imperial College in London. So that was a bit my way of coming back to this uh, interesting intersection of those two worlds that in a way shouldn't be separated. There's lots yep, of interesting yep, things, agree. Yeah. but like, unfortunately in, in the Western world, there's not a ton of uh, uh, education uh, options that really mix the two without like, pitting them against each other. So, so yeah. Yeah, but clearly from your accent, you didn't grow up in England or sunny England, <laughs> as we, we would say. So, so tell me more, a little more about this. Tell me more about your parents and what was it in them that, you know, they constantly encouraged you to be an inventor. That's a pretty cool thing, right? And you mentioned your grandparents. And the other thing I want to know is that were there early influences that kind of put in your mind that you want to do something that has to do with the planet? Were there things, can you think about instances when you of saw course, some packaging yeah. and you wanted to change that if something comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I was I was quite lucky that I grew up um, in kind of like a, a part of France, like slightly outside of Lyon, where we had we were surrounded by nature and there was like a farm at the end of the road and like there was this kind of like really nice immersion in uh, like not just like the urban jungle, but like this connection with, with the natural ecosystem that I think makes you understand that it's uh it's powerful it's precious that you need to kind of like uh, live in sync with it not against it so all of this was really well embedded for me um and i think uh, things like came really kind of like uh uh really clear when i was working at l'oreal and you are in like in the machine and like it's producing at uh, like 150 kind of like units per minute of those plastic items that will be used, thrown away. We don't really have a plan for kind of like how we're going to deal with it at the end of life, even if we have incredible engineering to make it in the first place. So that was really kind of like where I felt that there was the most tension. I was like, this is really like not going with nature. It's going complete against nature. Um, so, so yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that like I had, uh, a particular kind of like uh, a eureka moment. <laughs> eureka moment, like it's not like a, I always like dreamt of uh, working with seaweed. That what? Was like a... <laughs> I thought you were born thinking <laughs> yeah. about seaweed. And, you know, was it was it in the Provence region that you were or near? No, yes, yeah, so I was like near Lyon, um, and uh, and it's interesting because for me, like again, like when we we came to kind of like uh, learn more about seaweed, for me, seaweed was this. Thing that you're kind of like exposed to when you go to the beach it's a bit smelly it's yeah. a bit kind of like green gooey so they were i had like all these initial reactions that like most people have when they first learn about the material that we use yeah. um so it was it was really just um a lucky coincidence that like we 
uh, met with yeah, my too. co-founder Rodrigo during and this we'll master's. get to that bit <laughs> that yeah. I want a longer <laughs> conversation on. Um, yeah, that's that's amazing. Did you learn how to play piton? You got it. Yeah, piton, a little yeah? bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's uh, there's, and a, there's smoke a few. The cigar <laughs> <when> you're older. <laughs> it's it's the quintessential French. Uh, yeah, like, what you have to do. <laughs> okay, so these two things that you know when Alex was doing his research and then when when I was looking at your work. Other really, and then I mentioned this just before we started recording. What's this uh, art thing in you, which is the generative <laughs> artist by night? I want to know that, and of course your music, which is beautiful. It was kind of surreal the little bits that I heard. So tell me more about that, and also tell me how that influences your work today. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, like uh, there is not play during the day, but um, I, I'm I'm a curious person, and I like to uh, like. Uh, I guess have something that like brings me in a very different mindset. I think I find this very refreshing. So um, ever since I graduated from this master's where, where I met Rodrigo and we, we started with Notpla, um, I, I continued to explore some of the other things that really captured my imagination, I guess, from those two years that I like took after having worked. So it's like you, you really understand how amazing education is when you've kind of like realized that like work life doesn't allow for that much learning and you, you I really try to make the most of those two years. And so uh, one of the things that I was really interested in, I was like very interested in, in, in 3D printing. Um, I made a few kind of like uh, 3D printers myself and then kind of like had a, uh, like a, a work experience in one of the first Delta 3D printers um, in Taiwan. And so I was really kind of like interested in this, uh, uh, like interaction between the digital, the physical, um, and, and to a certain extent, that's when I kind of discovered as well, um, people that were not just doing it for functionality for a particular kind of like, uh, like a job or for making more efficient manufacturing or whatever it is, but who are using it for like the practice of, of art. And so, um, eventually I really discovered this whole, uh, like category of generative art which is really trying to leverage the power of an algorithm or mm -hmm. computer or some sort of uh, system that is going to go beyond what the human can do on his own. Yeah. Um, and it's really a collaboration between what uh, the, let's say the artist is going to be doing with this, but then you can achieve a degree of, of precision, a degree of kind of like randomness that is built in, that is ever changing, especially generative art, this idea that like, um, you create a recipe, but there could be like hundreds of different huh. variations that all have the same attributes. It's something that I'm really interested, very like geometry driven. So um, relatively kind of like uh, pleasing for the eye. And there's always yeah. something that is a bit playful about understanding. And between would the end result, chaos. sorry, I'm interjecting, but just my curiosity, uh, would the end result be different from what you had conceived? Because the very, machine yeah, is working yeah, exactly. as well. You're, you're fully accepting that you're giving up some of the control and something is kind of like going one yeah. way or another. And so this concept of, uh, generative art, um, has actually like exploded with, uh, like the, the NFTs and the whole kind of like huh. um, commercialization of it in a way. But I think before that, this was just something that people who had been trained in like coding would do as a bit of a, like a hobby. And so there was something that really like, uh, free from any, uh, capitalistic, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, pressure that I, I found at that time very interesting. So I, I was myself kind of like experimenting a bit, but also kind of like started to curate some of that, uh, like, uh, some of those artworks, some of those artists. So I created a, like a, a bit of a platform generative hut that went on to be quite popular. Like, yeah, 150, I saw like, yeah, 150,000 like followers. followers. So, and we did a couple of books and so on. So that's been something that is, um, very different to the kind of like the day job at Notpla, yeah. but something that I find kind of like uh, quite refreshing to think in in another world with a different perspective on very different uh, types of, uh, of of questions, um, yeah. and that that sometimes is just the the the, the refreshing of the brain that just yeah. makes you solve another problem for Notpla no, different, in yeah, a way that you would have never imagined. Yeah, and it's like life, right? You like when you when you're talking about this idea that you can give everything, and then you don't know what's going to happen after that. That's life as well, you right? It's pretty analogous. You some that uh, yeah, you have you don't have full control. You can give it all and then let it happen. And is it similar with your music as well? 
yeah so the music is something that uh actually was a bit of a a covid kind of like uh, activity to uh, <laughs> to deal with those uh lockdowns uh but uh similarly i i, I kind of like uh find my way to uh modular synthesizers that are essentially like lots of little blocks that do different functions uh -huh. and you you actually like plug wires like a bit when you were plugging uh like telephone calls from yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, different continents back in the 1950s it's very uh, very analog um but what's what's really interesting about it is that there is also um an entire field of generative music where okay. you don't really compose note by note or you don't perform note by note um the like the music you create a set of uh, random uh but quant quantized um like chance notes to appear at different times and all together you create this this recipe for what is an ever evolving sound that is still coherent that i find really interesting so huh. you can leave the machine on for like three days it's never going to repeat itself but wow. it's all going to have the same kind of like structure the same kind of uh, vibe so it's it's a different way of thinking like i'm going to start with like a yeah, like this note, and then there's going to be this chorus, and this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like it's it's just. But it's like very soothing as well. Playing like itself. The little bit that exactly. I heard, yeah, it sounds that it's uh, really interesting. I wish we could just keep talking about that, <laughs> but we cannot. <laughs> at least, at least not not right now. So maybe another time over drinks or something. But there's also uh, this. Uh, I find that either to some months or maybe a year that you spent in Australia while you were doing your undergrad, I guess. And what was that about? And then did that influence you in any way? that time there sure it was very influential uh year in my life um it was the first time that i traveled outside of europe it was the first time that i was uh living in a english-speaking country so i learned how to speak english in australia you didn't get the australian <laughs> accent <laughs> not too much <laughs> that french accent is quite uh quite here to stay uh, but um yeah i also um had quite a like it was it was a real kind of like eye opener of all of the other things that you can study because um like in the in the the, the residence the halls where i was staying um it wasn't that i was just in like the engineering school like i would be in france or um even just a technical school it was like all sorts of different uh, fields all kind of like staying in the same place so actually it was super interesting to uh to meet people that would study kind of like uh, natural science mm -hmm. or like economics or fine art or like political yeah, science yeah. And everyone was kind of like really mixed together and so that was a very enriching experience um and i think um there's this this concept of bridging like um, having the ability to know a little bit of different things that you can bring yep. some parallels from Absolutely. other industries i think that was a really rich moment for just getting exposed to things that I would otherwise not have discovered. That that was uh, like uh, yeah, I, I guess kind of like confirming to me that I really appreciate like being a generalist. Yeah, and a um, cross-functional exactly. kind of idea. And I guess all the things that you're doing, I can see them play mm. within what you mm. actually create because it's all very creative mm -hmm. what you're doing. And of course, you know, I'm sure your generative art and music and all of that also plays in. So let me jump now uh, to Imperial. And, uh, and and you mentioned it in passing, but I want to delve a little deeper into how did you meet Rodrigo and how did this whole idea evolve uh, from there? Yeah, so uh, this master's, um, it's quite it, it, it's quite special. Um, it really is more like an MBA for design engineering. So most people come after a few years in the industry. Okay. Um, so it's, it's also people who have kind of like uh, maybe confronted uh, the working environment, which is really rich um, in terms of like what people bring. Um, no one has the same background, so it's very, very um, diverse uh, and it's very uh, group project focused. So okay. it's about kind of like doing a succession of short projects, very open brief. So you actually choose what you want to work on. Um, and, and that was a, a super enriching experience because we covered so much ground. Um, um, I ended up uh, like uh, being also the co-founder of another uh, startup, which is about virtual reality. So uh -huh. nothing to do with seaweed, but within the same masters, we were exploring such a wide oh, wow. range of, of applications. And and so yeah, like uh, from from day one, kind of like um, met Rodrigo, instant kind of like uh, great connection. Um, we really became friends before we started working together. And I think that was kind of like something that was really 
powerful and Rodrigo is a super inspiring person has the ability of thinking differently about like anything and, and uh, proposing a completely different way of life of considering uh, like a situation that is, is really powerful. And so um, we, yeah, we, we, we just kind of like were um, super keen to collaborate on, on different things. Um, and he started a, a, a rather out there project of uh, making an artificial cloud. So huh. he was um, <laughs> basically um, really interested in this idea that you could use uh, the like the the lift from uh, like steam to actually propel uh, like with 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 that kind of like steam a giant cloud that would be transporting water from kind of like one part of the world to another, um, and he was made of a giant bubble. If you imagine like the, the top of the bubble is transparent, the bottom yeah. is kind of like reflective. That creates kind of like a like a solar oven that boils whatever initial water is in there and it would create that lift and you could transport like the, the, the water in, in very long distances, uh, hmm. very much like a cloud. Yeah. Uh, the idea is that like for this to work, the cloud would have to be like one kilometer wide or something. And so wow. you have to like create these giant, giant yeah. bubbles. Uh, but he actually like, made a prototype i think it was like 20 20 meter diameter wow. in high park big, yeah. um and it was a super kind of like creative uh project um which actually kind of like at, at, as a very very final small element brought the question okay imagine you transport all that water uh what do you deliver it with to kind of like the human scale and so the idea was like oh, it's, it can't be a, a plastic bottle that would be kind of like quite <laughs> sad. So what could be a, a, a natural solution to this? And there was these like giant bubbles. There was this interest in having something that would be like a lot more what you would find in nature. And there started a bit uh, an exploration around what kind of packaging could do that job. Um, and, um, and basically kind of like, um, like he started exploring all sorts of different ingredients um, from uh, like tapioca seeds, to uh, like cellulose and starch and uh, hydrogels and all sorts of different things. Um, and that's around the time that like we started to kind of like really uh, like also uh, look at this together um, with the background in, in packaging in L'Oreal. It was something that was kind of like quite interesting, a bit of a challenge. Um, and and uh, it was fascinating to discover that actually um, fake caviar, those mm -hmm. little kind of like fish bowls that okay. you, you get kind yeah. of like... Uh, they're actually made from seaweed oh, tube or yeah. something. Yeah. And so, um, we, uh, couldn't believe that like you could encapsulate essentially like fish flavored water yeah. with seaweed. And that was really like the starting point. Like, how do you make, how do you go from like a tiny bubble, uh, that is uh, like sold as a food product, as a cheap food product yeah. into actually making packaging. And huh. at that point we were like, okay, wow, seaweed, like we never thought of seaweed as a material, but it could potentially be interesting. And, the more we research about seaweed, the more we realize that actually it was ticking all the boxes. It was wow. very abundant. It was not requiring any fresh water, fertilizer, no GMOs, uh, no pesticides. Um, it was actually kind of like sequestering carbon as it grows. It was edible. It was biodegradable. Yep. So we're like, wow, like what's going on with seaweed? Why is no one using seaweed for, yeah. for packaging? And that, that gave us kind of like a, like a lot uh, of, uh, of ideas. So we started making bigger and bigger bubbles. We were working in our kitchen at that point. So it was no lab, no kind of like uh, fancy equipment, just uh, working off uh, uh, like reading the patterns from Unilever from the 1950s and trying to replicate these things in our, in our kitchen. And that was just, a, it, was, it was meant to be a project and then you yeah. move on to the next project. So to wrap it up um, with, with a little video that was a bit meant to be a tutorial on how to make this, yeah. um, like we, 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 we thought that this would be a good enough way of like wrapping the project yeah, and, kind of like, it. Uh, and, and moving on. Um, but that video actually went viral and people started <laughs> to kind of like be really interested. And I think, um, in a, in a few times in our kind of like history, it's been the external validation of people wanting to see more yeah. of this in the world that has kind of like made it happen for us. So those first videos, especially because it was like open source, you could just make this in your kitchen people jumped on this. There was like this, this, this cool thing in the kind of like, uh, like in, in, on a Sunday afternoon, you could get those powders of, 
Alibaba or Amazon or whatever <laughs> it is, cook up in your kitchen yeah. a little bubble and, and have a try. And so we saw some like incredible exploration from that starting point. People tried all sorts of different things. And I was like true open innovation. It was like people just sharing what they were finding out with this. And it was really, That's really amazing. creative. And it gave us like a lot of motivation to continue to be like, we need to make this a, uh, not just a science experiment in the kitchen, but actually we need to make this a reality. Um, and that was a bit the starting point where we were like, we were around the time of graduation and we're like, okay, let's, let's try to find a bit of uh, funding to actually do to this do as this. a proper company. Yeah. And within that, uh, when you're talking about that video, what I also heard was there was a lot of nature inspiration. You were looking at apples and and maybe other yeah, yeah, yeah. so fruits. how did that yeah fruits and because that's amazing mm -hmm. packaging right i am i'm always the one fruit which i'm really amazed with and i don't know if it comes in your dreams mm -hmm. as well but it's pomegranates mm -hmm. and it's so stunning the structure and the fine seeds and the film between mm -hmm. the seeds so yeah so so tell me a little more about that fruit inspiration mm -hmm. and you know how that played into uh, this idea of using seaweed and creating something absolutely like there was this um like this idea that we could really create like success is if this outcome looks like you could find it in nature. If that's a shape that like nature would come up with, um, if the transparency, the color, whatever is kind of like fruit, like it feels like it's an interesting starting point for, for this project. And so, um, we looked at lots of different, um, uh, examples from, from the, the nanoscale, the way in our cells, membranes are used to kind of like contain lipids that prevent our cells from being kind of like um like uh protected from from uh, out like outside aggressions uh to like uh, egg yolk um oh, yeah. all of these other kind of like membranes that nature uses because they work the the material works in traction not in compression so it's yeah. very useful like very efficient use of the materials so um we and also we we wanted to use uh like covered ingredients. We wanted to use something that you would literally eat. No questions asked because it was in our kitchen. Like if we used anything nasty, we were going to contaminate our kitchen. So yeah. was, there was no way that we could bring something that would be kind of like uh, a danger. So that was a very good kind of like safeguarding to make sure that none of the ingredients we, we, we work with would have um, the potential for being not edible. Um, and this idea of edible packaging was also um, like borrowed from fruits, you can eat the peel of yeah. a fruit, but you don't have to. And it's a bit the same with some of our edible packaging. We say like you can eat it, but also nature can eat it. Um, yeah. and that's not like a requirement that you need to eat your packaging. It's a bit of a provocation, That's smart. but it's, yeah. uh, it, the moment it's edible, it's in another category. It's no, it's no longer in the category of like bioplastics, bio base, bio source, like all of these things, they still sound like you definitely should not eat them. Once we are in edible, people are like, okay, that's something that I understand. I've seen the peel of a, of a fruit rot, go back to nature. Um, I will, I'm sure we'll talk about like the range of compostables from like mm -hmm. the very easy to break down to the like, uh, yep. ones that require industrial composting. But for us, it was important to, to anchor this in the world that people know with the fruit and veg that they consume. It's interesting that you mentioned that uh, there was another person who came on the podcast, Dinesh uh, Tarapalli, and he pointed out something very interesting in that area. So he was making edible spoons. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because he said the challenge becomes that you're governed by a different law because now it's food. Yeah. So in his case, he had to package each one of the spoons separately. So he says, my cost rises yeah. also because it's edible mm. and it cannot be contaminated anymore. So does that also play in your mind when so you're the, thinking about it? For edible? us, it was the other way around because actually it was way easier to set ourselves up as like making food than as a packaging manufacturer. Uh -huh. So like in the UK, I mean, like you could be a, uh, like a food vendor. You just have to register to the council. You can prepare the food in your kitchen. Off you go. Like, so it's very easy to so maybe the start country laws food. are different. Exactly. Yeah. And that was really interesting because if we had to set up as, as a packaging manufacturer, it would be like very complex. We'd have to do all sorts of kind of like migration tests and so mm -hmm. on. But actually like if you're saying like, yeah, but this is food. Yeah. And then you're kind of like respecting the world of food, then you're, you're in. So. Huh. That was, that was to us a, an easier entry point into the packaging space. So interesting, different perspectives. Um, so what about Rodrigo? What's his background? 
and yeah. Uh, and yeah, like how did he come to Imperial? Just tell us a little bit about him and where For does sure. he come from? So he's from Madrid, uh, Spanish, and uh, he first trained as an architect. Um, he actually kind of like uh, is a true uh, like academia kind of like uh, addict. He has five masters. Oh my he gosh. studied until his thirties. I could finish my one. So. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he found a bit the like the trick. Um, um, he, he managed to find some like great um, scholarships, which meant that he could keep on like learning and, and, and exploring kind of like different uh, different parts of the world, different kind of like, uh, like education systems. Um, so he first trained as an architect, and I think um, he's, he's the first one to say like he was frustrated by how long a architecture project takes from like start to finish. So he has really drawn into the, the faster kind of like uh, paced architecture projects, like for example, installations, events, temporary kind of like architecture. Um, and one of the projects that actually kind of like really made him work a lot with plastic was uh, he was making temporary uh, arches and, and installations in city centers by using uh, like, like plastic bottles, discarded plastic bottles inside of like a bag in which you could suck out the air. And as it kind of like shrinks around the bottles, it locks in huh. a bit like when you use those bags for your clothes to kind of like compress them, you go from something that is quite soft and malleable yeah. to actually kind of like something that is really yeah. like hard when you remove all the air. And this idea was that like, he would be able to kind of like remodel those kind of like uh, th those arches, however he wanted uh, with just bringing back the air in the bags and then kind of like uh, removing it. And so it was, it was, it was also a way of bringing bottles in kind of like the city in a way that is not waste, yeah. but actually showing the, like like the material, cycle. exactly. Yeah. The material is something that we throw away. We don't think too much about it, but actually it is this like, it's a building material. It's like indestructible. And yeah. so there was something really interesting about trying already to, to showcase to people how there was a lack of circularity in our current packaging and how this material is indestructible. It's very resistant and that's a really great attribute for lots of applications, but maybe for kind of like a quick 15 minute uh, hydration, that's uh, overkill. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Two thoughts to that. Number one is we, at our home, uh, we we keep, because in, a, in at least in US, you can't, I tried initially that I don't want to have any packaging. So I would go buy bulk food and all of that, but you cannot avoid it, right? It will come. So what we started doing was taking the plastic bottles and really stuffing them with any plastic mm -hmm. that was there instead of trying to you know, down cycle it or something like that. And we've just, my daughter and I, we've just been creating these eco bricks mm. that someday we'll make a structure with it, nice. but it's still <laughs> evolving. The second funny story that came to my mind just randomly, when uh, my middle daughter was four years old, uh, we asked her what she wants to be. And she said, I am going to be a designer. And I said, okay, what kind of designer? I'm just going to design everything. So we said, okay, are you going to design jewelry? Yes, clothes, yes. What about houses? No, 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 no houses. So, so we said, why not houses? No, no, they're too big. It takes a lot of work. <laughs> so, so she wanted That's to do true. things that are small. And uh, the other interesting thing, but many interesting things, but the other interesting thing that uh, we read was the name, the yeah. Notpla name. And the name that came before was Skipping Rocks Lab. So tell me about this movement from if there was a Skipping Rocks Lab and how did that come and how did you get to Notpla? Yeah, so again, the project was not meant to be a startup. It was a student project. We, we kind of like finished with this uh, video and then, then we kind of like moved on. And so at that point, when we st first started to apply for grants and, and start to think a little bit about what we could be doing, we had to pick a name to incorporate the company. We didn't really have kind of like too much, uh, too many thoughts. And uh, the the year before, uh, as part of our masters, we had spent a little bit of time in New Zealand. Okay. And actually, we spent quite a lot of time in New Zealand. They have like beautiful lakes. Oh yes. Definitely. And we were just uh, like uh, like throwing these these rocks that ah, just kind of yeah, like yeah, yeah, uh, skip. And so um, we were both kind of like not uh, English native speakers. Yeah. So we didn't know what this was called. Uh -huh. So we asked someone who said like, uh, like skipping rocks. Yeah. Actually like in the UK, you, you say skimming stones. Yeah. So 
it was like, uh, like yeah, we, we just kind of like went with it thinking that it was the, the right way to call it when actually people were like, what is Skipping Rocks? It's a pretty cool uh, name. But the idea, and everyone was doing labs at the time, so we're like, okay, it's going to be Skipping Rocks Lab. And a lot of kind of like post-rationalization, but what we liked about like uh, Skipping Rocks is that it, there is something impossible that you're resolving. Like a rock is not supposed to fly, but yet there is a way That's to kind of like find it. True. And it was a bit like a challenge. How do we solve this problem of, of, of plastic pollution uh, by finding a, a clever kind of like way yeah. to just reorganize everything and make it work? And how did not pla happen? So with, I think Skipping Rocks was great to get started, but it really didn't say much about like what we were trying to do. Yeah. And at the beginning, the first product, uh, OHO, uh, which is also like an interesting like yeah. naming kind of like convention yeah, yeah, yeah. because um, the name actually comes like those first bubbles, we would literally kind of like make them in our kitchen and they would, would show it to, uh, to our flatmates. And the first kind of like reaction of people were like, whoa, and so they were like, okay, that's the name <laughs> that's of the it. <laughs> so that works in every language. Um, and, and to this day, it's, it's always nice when we show them, bring them on an event or something like this. And there's someone that goes like, oh, I was like, yes, that's, that's the name. name. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I think at some point we realized that there was going to be more than OHO. We could use this seaweed technology uh, for uh, for more applications. And that's when we started to think, what is the the long-term kind of like thing we're trying to create? And there was really this, this idea like, we are not plastic. Um, and so after some time we realized that like, it was uh, going to be interesting for us to really think of what we're doing as an ingredient brand uh, with the like examples of like a, a Gore-Tex, a Lycra, uh, like Intel inside. We wanted to have something that would be representative of this category of materials that are not plastic. Mm -hmm. So that's where not plastic came from. Yeah, but I remember two years back when we met two or three mm -hmm. years back, uh, you were very, it was interesting how clear you were that you were not BLA. Yeah, 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 which was also interesting because so so was that in play as well when you were establishing the name as yes, not BLA that, exactly so that was it was it's a good kind of like play on words and it works for 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 for, for both obviously and obviously like PLA has been very present in this space so I think there was a little bit of like a cheeky we are not PLA yeah so we kind of like taking a bit uh, like a, a stance on this but the interesting thing about the name actually like we found out after the fact is that. Uh, if you're in a conference uh, where people really know about materials, they will assume that the name is not PLA. Yeah. Whereas if you're talking to people in general, they don't really know what PLA well, is yeah. and I'll take it not pla. So you almost instantly know if you're talking to an expert and you can like raise a bit the level <laughs> of the conversation or if you're just starting from the base. And so it ah, works as so a now I understand filtering. <laughs> I was thinking that you had a lot to say about not PLA. <laughs> Which is, if you remember yeah, yeah, two yeah, years yeah, back, sure. you were literally very... For clear sure. that um, I'm not PLA, and absolutely. you know, so so I thought that was maybe something that there that <laughs> motivated you. Okay, so now let's get to the weed of seaweed. <laughs> you know, tell tell us more about you. Of course, mentioned that there was this material, uh, but how did that one? Of course, this idea that you played around, but how did that evolve, and how does it work? Why does it excite you so much? Why is it so interesting as a material? So the thing is, we're gonna need a lot of a certain material to actually like stop using the 400 million tons of uh, plastic that we are kind of like pumping out every year. And so when we, st when we search for those materials, it was quite easy. It was like, it has to be something that is like super available. Like yeah. it can't be a niche material. It can't be kind of like something that is like slow to make. It has to be really abundant. And actually like, when you look at it, there's few things that are more available than, than seaweed. Um, some species uh, like microcystis can grow up to one meter per day. So it's like the fastest growing organism on the planet. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to use that instead of petroleum that takes millions and millions of years to be made in the first place. Um, and also I think that like we realized that there was all of these ethical issues around using more and more agricultural land to create packaging instead of food. And so the idea that you could grow something in the ocean that you would not require any fresh water, you would not require kind of like fertilizer, all these efforts to grow it when you could be growing food was something that was really kind of like interesting. And obviously it had to be naturally biodegradable. Um, and the beautiful thing about seaweed is that actually like it's been around for longer than anything 
on the surface of the planet. He, everything started with in, in the ocean and, and seaweed was there before. So it's kind of had like a billion years extra compared yeah. to anything else to really get fully integrated in nature. So the level of biodegradability of seaweed, um, wherever anything ends up is, is, is very high. And we, we were quite keen on this idea that, um, we wanted to like today, too many packaging solutions are saying like, it's going to be great if we have a hundred percent of this one end of life that makes sense. And like, it's a pity that we don't get there, but like, we really need to get to a hundred percent of this end of life. Reality is we're not going to ever hit a hundred percent of one end of life and zero percent of all of the end of life. So we can't just expect things to be a hundred percent recycled or a hundred percent like, um, composted or whatever it is. And for us, the important thing is that like none of the end of life would create a problem. So it's mm. more like thinking of the system is going to be inefficient for some time. How do we make sure we never put in this world a material that's going to be there for kind of like uh, hundreds of years? Yeah, and wherever it ends up. Exactly. It doesn't it may, may not end up in a recycling facility or exactly. a downcycling facility or a landfill, but it'll still yeah. be okay. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Interesting. But we say so easily, right? Seaweed. Mm. But actually, if you think that like you obviously think a lot more than I do, but uh, the number of varieties. So mm. how did you decide on like, how did you analyze these varieties and how did you choose whichever varieties you did? How did that evolve? How did that thinking and understanding of seaweed itself? Because as far as I know, seaweed has been used for a long time in food mm. ingredients and in medicine capsules and stuff like that. So, so how did that evolve and how did you choose the right species? Yeah. Well, we're still kind of like trying to answer this question today, um, but we, 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 we piggybacked on a lot of uh, the existing science on seaweed that has been done by the pharma industry, by the food industry, the cosmetics industry, fertilizers industry. So we're not starting from scratch. Um, there's more than 12,000 species of seaweed, but like definitely there are some that are better understood than others. And so that was a bit our starting point, like starting with things that are already at scale, things that are used uh, for other applications and, and kind of like understanding how we could start from there. But then we're, we're continuously going kind of like further. I mean, like this is our wall of uh, seaweed kind of like uh, sample. Nice. So we have kind of like all sorts of different uh, like samples in, in the catalog and, and always trying to understand how we can go further. Um, the great thing is that there are some similarities between species. So it's not like we all rely on just one French seaweed mm. for the whole world. We, uh, we can actually at scale, imagine that we're going to have very localized supply chains, but we're starting with people that are already operating with seaweed at scale for those other industries. Because one of the things we didn't want to do is like build factories from scratch, have to do all of the manufacturing ourselves. We knew that like this would not be the fastest way to scale. Um, at least for now, that's not like our views that like we should be, uh, the ones trying to build additional kind of like factories. If there are people who are already operating them very well with yep. different feedstocks or different objectives. So we partner. Um, so yeah, so like we, the, 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 the first thing was to spend a lot of time with the seaweed supply Experts, chain and yeah. the geeks surrounds. of seaweed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, how does this work? So, so of course the way the general public would know seaweed is this beautiful kind of sea kelp forests and, you know, things and things that get washed into the ocean, uh, out of the ocean. Um, but I presume the supply chain is more developed than that. So how does this work? Somebody kind of uh, takes the seaweed from there. Then how does, how do they process to get to the material that you need and how well built is that supply chain already? Yeah. So, um, I'll take the analogy of like making, uh, like starch from corn. Yeah. We're really talking with like a, something very similar here. So today you have people who are kind of like already creating lots of different extracts of seaweed. Seaweeds are made of like hundreds of different kind of like compounds and you just selectively like purify the, the, the one that you're interested in. Uh -huh. And that's a bit how we approach this. So we work with, with people who are already doing this for those different uh, applications, whether it's like pharma or cosmetic or fertilizer. <coughs> And they work themselves with seaweed farmers and seaweed harvesters that locally will kind of like gather up the, the, the biomass and then turn it into those, uh, those extracts. And so it's by working with the people who have already like an industrial scale and by tweaking their process and getting kind of like them to think 
not from like a cosmetic perspective or a pharma perspective, but from a packaging perspective, how we can boost the right properties that make more sense for making packaging, that we can get them to actually produce that um, for us to start our formulation work and then from there create kind of like the right uh, right applications. And is it quite scaled up already? Can you get yeah, enough of whatever material you want and whatever form you want or? For sure, like, yeah. I mean, we don't realize, but seaweed is already used in so many applications. Oh it's, okay. in the, it's in our toothpaste, it's in the, the foam of beer for, for the foam not to kind of like collapse too quickly. It's in um, like Philadelphia cream cheese. It's in oh, wow. lots of kind of like, is agar agar also out of seaweed? Yeah, so that's that, one yeah. of the kind of like elements that is used for like cooking and making yeah. jellies and so on. So you have all of these different uses of seaweed that people don't realize but yeah. like are, are there, which means that like the industry is already kind of like uh, like generating kind of like um, very large volumes already um, fully at scale, fully optimized for those applications, not for packaging. Yeah. But they are kind of like already like in a very good position to be able to consider how to make packaging solutions better. But I guess there must be different components of the plant, right? That somebody uses it for agar agar, another part may be used for toothpaste or what have you. So, so what is the component that you would use? What is it that, what is your raw material? What would you buy from a producer? Yeah. So, I mean, like, obviously there's like a secret sauce, of course. Yeah, but yeah. Um, what we use is like really like the the thing that like provides seaweed um, like its structure uh -huh. and that like gives it its kind of like ability to hold all of the different elements together. So uh, by, by using this kind of like this gelatin from seaweed, this glue, we are able to turn that into a range of different applications, like for example, our coating for takeaway boxes or our bubbles for kind of like uh, OHO. Um, while on the other end, there are a lot of other components that are uh, not going to be like use for the those applications yeah. but still use for other kind of like applications yeah. so for example yeah. there's a lot of uh, really interesting uh, marine fibers in seaweed that we can use for making paper and cardboard wow. and so by kind of like selectively picking the right components we can say hey this one's going to be used in this proportion for this particular application this other one for this other one and then ideally you use a hundred percent of the biomass of the seaweed and you just use that part for this product that part for this product Hmm. Super interesting. And uh, uh, when you when you look at the uh, coming back to the varieties, would the structure of the product shift? Like if you were to you take a tropical seaweed, then if you take a gel from that, would it completely be completely different? different. Yeah. Oh, wow. And like actually, because again, like seaweed has spent a billion years, um, like more than any like plant, to evolve in all sorts of different ways you've got some species of seaweed that will be more genetically different than between a mushroom and a human. And we call it seaweed, but they are kind of like that different genetically. So they'll have completely different properties, completely different uh, components. And that's part of the, like what we do at NotPly is to understand, to research and to kind of like uh, extract the right elements so that we can actually get the property that matters for making this packaging do this or this packaging do this. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, what, when you were talking about the gel, like we work with cellulose, it seemed like it's the lignin of the seaweed, mm. right? That which binds it together. And then you take that and create mm. stuff from it. And when you, when you buy it from a supplier, is it well homogenized? Like you're able to, because as soon as you get a non-homogenized feed, you're going to get a non-homogenized output. So the suppliers are able to do that, you know, whatever variety you want, they're able to homogenize and provide you exactly the spec that you want. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, like the, the great thing is that, um, like, again, back to the fake caviar that like got us started in the first place, Unilever for the last kind of like 70, 80 years has been buying kind of like hundreds of tons of this material. So they have kind of like made the supply chain find solutions to all of the variable variability that like a natural product has. So typically you can like get like very constant uh, properties by just blending different batches together and just homogenizing them across the year. So as long as you hold enough stock for a certain period, by blending the, the different kind of like points, you just get something very smooth, a bit like uh, today, the starch industry is able to give you kind of like a very kind of like reliable starch. Like that's, that's uh, that same principle applies to, uh, to seaweed. 
So interesting. And when it comes to the manufacturing process, so you get a raw material. Is it very similar? Because we again see, you know, you more than me again, mm -hmm. you know, we see so many of these seaweed based companies come up. And is it pretty similar when it comes to the manufacturing process or even that is different for everybody? Do they take the same kind of thing and approach the same and the devil is in the detail or how does it work? How does the manufacturing yeah. process work and differ? So, I mean, um, it's hard to speak for the others because I think um, they are still at lab scale. No one has really kind of like put any scale, product on yeah, the market true. except except for Notplus. So, but I think that um, each product is almost kind of like requiring a different process and a different like uh, set of, of, of conditions to be solved for. Um, but over overwhelmingly, like everyone, I think has a huge uh, interest in retrofitting into the existing industry. So it means that like. If you're doing um, like uh, rigid products, you want this to be injection molded. Yeah. So you in create a very, like a pellet. Like, exactly. Um, yeah. if, if you're kind of like looking at like making paper, you wanted this to work on like yeah. a regular paper mill and so on. So a lot of the, the work we do is to actually solve for um, like machines that were never developed to work with seaweed, yeah. but we have to work on those machines because otherwise we're not going to be compatible with the existing infrastructure yeah, and, you can't change and, the whole... yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, and we don't have appetite to build new machines and new new kind of like uh, like manufacturing plants so so yeah like a lot of the work is just how do we make it work with the plastics industry ah, super interesting and um, when it comes to usages because you started inferring to that and you and i were talking yesterday and you said a lot of focus is towards coatings mm -hmm. and uh, why did you think of that like you know you were doing the oho kind of uh, idea of edible and then you've of course created and i see a lot of products here hopefully we'll see show them on the screen uh but uh, why why did you kind of go towards coatings and uh, what motivates that direction so um we actually started working on the coatings um mainly because we were partnering at that point with uh, just eat the like uh, delivery platform and we were like we discovered that like the typical um, like cardboard takeaway container is actually just not just cardboard there is something else to provide resistance to the grease and, and, and to the moisture and yeah i mean like we should have known better but like even us in the packaging industry were like just assuming that it was cardboard it wasn't and so we started to think if we could use our seaweed not to do the whole thing, but to actually just do the barrier properties, maybe that's a way that we could kind of like get, uh, get to scale quite quickly. And so um, that's something that uh, with the, the, the support, both in terms of connecting us with uh, like uh, early adopters, restaurants um, that just it provided, but also just having a little bit more credibility when we went to talk to some of the manufacturers being like, hey, just it is really interested in this. Can we actually try it on your machine and so on? That we identified a bit of a path to industrialize this. Um, and for us, it was really interesting because the cellulose from the cardboard is actually completely natural, biodegradable. So mm -hmm. the yeah. problem of those containers is really kind of like only the 5% plastic that is kind of like coated on it or like the PFAS that is added on the pulp molding mm -hmm. one. But um, the, the base, like the overall, overwhelming kind of like majority of the material has mm -hmm. like ticked all the boxes already. So it really feels that like we just need to finish the job with a material that is natural. Um, and I think that's where we realized that coating was a, a really interesting place, especially food service where you need to hold food for a few minutes, a few hours, maybe like a couple of days, but you don't need to kind of like have the indestructibility of, of plastic um, because of the short use case that felt like a real good place for seaweed to do the job. And when it comes to functional properties, so if a mill is using a PBOH or a starch based or some kind of compound, um, are you seeing that you can do as well or better uh, than those products? Yeah. So, I mean, like today we have, um, we're just about to kind of like pass the 10 million single use plastics replaced with our boxes Yay. on the market. So we are definitely kind of like now past the MVP and having kind of like it used in 10 countries, uh, we have kind of like some now big partnerships with uh, the catering uh, like industry as well, um, with Compass Group and Levy. We are in nice. 50 stadiums across the UK and, and Ireland. So we're really now at a point where there is um, like widespread kind of like 
use and validation for that food service industry where the performances are met, uh, the price is acceptable, um, sustainability is kind of like getting everyone to agree that this Amazing. is something that like uh, is worth kind of like investing in. And, and now we're seeing that like there is like demand rising quickly. Wow. And so what about uh, capacity? Like I know that mm. you're, we were talking again that, you know, you know that the mm. supply is available, the manufacturing capability is available, and there is at least the rising demand. So how are you saying, seeing the scaling of manufacturing mm. now? And let's stick with coating, but then I want mm. to get into the other products that you're excited about. For sure. Um, so the great thing again is like we have, it's taken a while, but we, we have searched and found manufacturing partners in the industry that have um, like machines at scale that can produce like almost kind of like infinite amount of material or at least like industrial amount of material, like tens of millions of units per, per quarter, um, which is great because now it's really on us to, to get them that volume, to get that kind of like machine running full speed all the time to get the economies of scale and optimize. So we really have unlocked the manufacturing again, the, 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 on, on the, the seaweed supply chain, uh, we, we're dropping the ocean compared to the use for all of these other applications. So we really have no limits on that front either. Um, so the exciting thing is that now we really have the ability to kind of like accelerate on the deployment of this solution, uh, by partnering, not trying to do everything ourselves, not yeah. trying to kind of like build it from scratch, um, like the machine and the material and the kind of like plants and the brand and everything, but just kind of like partnering with all these other stakeholders to actually get to scale faster. And would you at all consider setting up manufacturing or no, you'll stay away from that because it's already there. I think <clears throat> today we have no reason to, to do it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think there's, there's, there's a range of different products that we're developing for some of them. There might be more of a reason to kind of like think that we want to get into manufacturing, but as long as we can have faster impact with uh, people, um, that like it's a win-win for everyone. The yeah. value chain is kind of like, uh, like equally compensated. I think that it's a very healthy model. If at some point, um, like some elements change, we, we can adapt, but I think that like, that's a bit the yeah. fastest way to, to scale. Yeah, and then you're not asset heavy. You can be exactly. more, yeah. definitely more flexible. Um, and, and you said the cost is also getting to the stage where it's acceptable. Correct. Yeah. And like, nice. Is there a premium? Of course, there's a premium. We are operating in such a small yeah. scale compared to like the plastics industry that there is, there is definitely kind of like some lack of uh, optimizations that will come with time. Uh, but I think that like fundamentally, <clears throat> I truly believe that seaweed has the potential of being the most affordable solution on the market. Maybe not kind of like as cheap as plastic today because plastic doesn't take into account its externalities. So yep. It's fake low price. But when you look at like solutions that actually kind of like take care of, of, of all of the externalities. I think seaweed is really kind of like ideally placed for being the, the most affordable. Yeah. And that's because I'm seeing, and I'm tempted from the beginning <laughs> to see all these products lying in front of me. So what are the other usages, like the ones lying in front of us uh, that you are excited about beyond coatings? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like we started with this, right? The yeah. OHO edible Can bubbles. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so. This one is like super fun. We often yep. say it's a bit like the concept car for Nutpla. It's the one that like gets people to understand that if it's edible, it's natural, it's going to biodegrade. So yep. it's, it's relatively easy to imagine that the rest of the portfolio is as virtuous as the one that you can eat. Yep. Um, and with this product, we've been through kind of like a lot of, uh, changes. It's been like, uh, a, a real kind of like exploration of what is supposed to do, possible to do with the new form factor. Yeah. Um, and we've decided to like really focus on uh, running events and, and marathons. Yeah. That's which great is where there's a lot of kind of like instant consumption and it feels like it's a really excellent kind of like use case. Um, and so we're, we're now kind of like, uh, really partnering with, uh, like the like world leaders in sports, decathlon to bring this uh, for energy gels for kind of like replacing the typical aluminum plastic sachets that are used for energy gels. So that's really the, the focus. Um, and um, hopefully it's coming to kind of like uh, marathons all around Europe very soon. Um, so that's an exciting collaboration. We've, we've kind of like taken a step back from um, the other types of content and applications just because 
uh, we need to demonstrate focus yeah. and we need to grow where we where we can. Um, so for the other products, for example, coating, yeah, like uh, food service is really like the the area of focus at the moment. Um, but there's a lot of like other exciting stuff. So for example, um, if I start with like the pipette, so pipette is not too dissimilar to kind of like Oho, but mm -hmm. this one is actually kind of like really focused on um, like dosing olive oil for salads or for kind of like uh, home what delivery uh, like meals. And so you, would you just can like cut the top, twist, twist the top, then, and yeah. then you just kind of like yeah, yeah. Uh, dose the oil. It's still technically edible, but like this one is a lot thicker, so it's not really kind of like going to be super nice to eat. Yeah, but it's also kind of like a lot more resistant, yeah. so you can yeah. imagine to have kind of like um, like something a bit more sturdy for applications that require it. Um, and then what's quite exciting, we, we're working on like flexible films, well, so nice. um, that's obviously like a super wide range of applications. Yeah. We have uh, soluble films, so we can make the whole kind of like pasta sachet dissolve in like boiling water. You can wow. imagine yeah. same with like instant coffee or uh, all sorts of different applications. A big opportunity for replacing PVOH for detergent capsules. Yeah. So that's something that we are kind of like working on at the moment. Um, we are still kind of like uh, working on the industrialization. So there's still a little bit of work for this to be infinitely manufacturable like we have done with the coating what, what is that one? so that's like a dose of kind of like uh, laundry detergent ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, or dishwasher and you tablets. just put it in the dishwasher and the whole yeah. thing yeah. similar to pvoh exactly, yeah. and so it's a way of replacing well. yeah. pvoh which is kind of like uh, made from petroleum and, and, yeah. and not like soluble and not uh, like so biodegradable um and and then um we have yeah like different form factors so this is kind of like uh something that is more kind of like a uh, a little dose of uh, either spices yeah. or kind of like an instant drink. Um, so you can imagine quite a lot of applications. Yeah. Um, but the feel is totally different than this one. So it's just a different structure. Yeah. So we have lots of different films. And in a way, like we're still working on optimizing which film is going to work better, yeah. not just for the end product, but also for the manufacturing process. So um, we think that like in the next six months, we should get films on the market, like made at like high speed on high kind of like uh, volume lines. But right now there's still a little bit of kind of like tweaks and, yeah, and, and optimizations. Yeah. But uh, but the the key kind of like properties is really like we need to, to be heat sealable to be able to kind of like work through those machinery. Yeah. Um, and we are mostly targeting dry content because we also like are conscious that the seaweed that we use doesn't necessarily have like the highest barrier properties. Well, people, yeah. So it's not really for kind of like containing like wet food or wet products. It's going to be like containing a drink. So we're containing a drink for a shorter, shorter amount time. of time. So it has to between being manufactured and consumed, there has to be a shorter time. Exactly. Like just a few weeks, a few months, a bit oh, like a, that's like cool a fruit. Though. A few yeah. weeks is pretty, or oh, yeah. a month you say is, a, is still. Yeah. A, and, and does it, is it also a balance when I look at something like that product, because it has to sustain a certain amount of, because it'll be put in a box and it'll be taken and you can't have many of them burst. No, one or two bursting is okay. And is that the right balance to find it as well? What is the thickness? What is the strength? You have to, I guess, For sure. get yeah. to the right so place. So right? big balance because if you're going to eat it, you don't want to chew on something for too long. Sure. So it needs to be the right thickness. Um, so actually like we have now really kind of like validated this product for events yeah. where they are kind of like delivered in um, like big kind of like reusable crates uh -huh. that like the volunteers are going to yeah. like distribute during the, the race. Uh, whereas um, for kind of like retail, we're more looking at like a, like a box of uh, like 12 doses or something like mm -hmm. this that you can mm -hmm. use for like training. Yeah. And in that case, um, it needs to be kind of like longer shelf life. So that's a lot of the work that we've been doing with Decathlon to, to really optimize yeah. um, for this longer shelf life. Um, whereas for kind of like the film, typically you're talking about like retail, which is requiring kind of like years of shelf life. So that's why with a dry product, you can achieve that. Whereas a, a wetter product yeah. is more challenging. So interesting. The other thing you've been really, you've mastered in a way, is this whole domain of fundraise. So <laughs> whether you've mastered or everybody immediately <laughs> sees the amount of, uh, you know, purity you come from in a way. Mm. And then the purity and purpose. So, you know, right from your initial crowdfunding, I heard mm -hmm. that it was three days and you got 850,000 pounds. And then, of course, raising different rounds. And then, of course, the big one in terms of at least mm. uh, the media hype, which was the Earthshot Prize. It'd be amazing for, I'm sure the listeners would love to learn from that whole journey on how that has worked out and, and what are the tips that, you know, you have learned in the process. 
Well, I think um, one thing that is important to to say is that it's highly dependent of the like macroeconomic situation. So I don't think that like we can uh, uh, like be too kind of like uh, full of ourselves for having kind of like uh, achieved much because it, it really depends on like the timing and, 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 and everything that's happening in the world. But uh, I think it's important, like, well, the strategy in startups is like, you have to survive until the next wave and then you have to surf it. Um, but I think that um, we have certainly seen vastly different conditions um, like in, in the, the few years that we've been kind of like, uh, like in existence. At the beginning, plastic was not an emotional topic. It was something that had not yet been like covered extensively by the media. There was like, yes, it's like a lot of like macro pollution bottles in the ocean, but it was before like the turtle with like yeah, the straw. straw and so on. So I think that that completely changed kind of like the, the public opinion. And so our very first round was actually like really hard. We actually tried to go to kind of like angel investors and funds, but we just didn't have any traction. And like for, for close to a year, we just got zero, zero um, kind of like interest past the first call. Um, and that's why we decided to go to the crowd to ask for kind of like that funding because it was a bit of a like all in last effort. If we don't raise this, we're just going to stop. Yeah. And I think that's where, again, like the crowd has been amazing in backing us because I think without them, we would have kind of like yeah. gone to do something else. Um, and that was a much more simple like question. Like, do you want to see more of these kind of alternatives in the world at a consumer level? people were saying yes at an investor level, they were like all sorts of like risk. And am I going to be the first one and who's going to follow? And so it was, it was basically kind of like not fundable for investors or like investors who were too scared of kind of like coming in. Whereas for people, it was like, we just need to see more of these alternatives. Yeah. And I think things have like vastly changed a few years later. We see kind of like uh, funds popping up left and right about the ocean, about plastics. So now there's people who have like a, an actual mandate to invest in these things, which is great, but like is, is kind of like also something that has been like maybe overplayed a bit. And all of a sudden you have all sorts of like companies that are getting um, very high kind of like valuations and not much to, to show for that like creates also a lot of kind of like uh, scrutiny on, yeah. on, on, on the Especially industry. Especially the field. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit like, we, we need kind of like uh, VC funds, but like either they are kind of like too risk adverse and there's no funding or they are too excited and there's way too much funding, but there's no kind of like constant measured amount of funding in the space. And so um, we, yeah, like we, we then kind of like did a, a series A, um, like a, a seed round in 2019 and a series A in, in 2021. And I think 2021 was kind of like this kind of like year of um, a lot of excitement. People wanted to see kind of like acceleration. Um, so it, it was it was a, a really great kind of like uh, injection of capital that allowed us to actually like make these things a reality. We took this money and we launched those products and now we are selling like millions of these products, replace million, millions of single-use plastics. We really kind of like hit uh, those milestones. But then like the world came a bit kind of like uh, this, this, this macro kind of like uh, trouble where all of a sudden no one wants to invest again. So I think we're, we're, we're constantly kind of like in and out of uh, fashion. And that's where the Earth Shirt price has been amazing because in a way the Earth Shirt price is here to say these things are hard and we need to give them extra support because otherwise no one is ever going to kind of like manage to develop them and like make them a reality. And so they've been a, a really fantastic supporter and we're really humble to have kind of like won it um, in the first place. But then like um, it, like almost a million pound is just kind of like a, the smaller element of the value that they can oh, deliver yeah, for absolutely. you. It's all about kind of like the incredible connections, um, the like the genuine kind of like interest of Prince William to accelerate the movement and to really yeah. kind of like make those things happen uh, at scale. Um, and for us, it's been like, yeah, really transformational. Yeah, I'm sure. And you're right. Like, it's not about that million pounds. <coughs> it's about the, it, it's not, it's not even, I don't think it's even the connections. It's the whole experience, mm -hmm. right? Like competing. I'm sure there were great people there to mm -hmm. be able to kind of edge that, to be with people who can inspire. 
I'm sure it's all of that that mm. gets packaged into that. And of course, more than anything else, you get this visibility without spending your media dollars, mm. right? And you would we would never get it, right? Even if we were to spend a lot of dollars or pounds on media, you mm. could not get that visibility. Suddenly you are everywhere. Right, which is so amazing. So what was it like to meet Prince William? Yeah, I mean, he's been incredibly generous with his time. I think we've we've met him like seven or eight times oh, wow. to date. So it feels like uh, we really got to know him. He's actually like really into seaweed, which is really exciting because I think that beyond Notpla, there's many other really good use of seaweed. We need kind of like to really develop the the whole value chain. And and he's a, he's a big believer in that. And I think that... Um, he also has, yeah, like it, it, it's not nothing for him to associate himself with this because like a lot of those solutions could fail. It's like a risky, um, like a, a risky position. And I think it's really amazing how through this and, and thanks to Prince William, we also get to talk to people who don't care about sustainability at all. They are yeah. just here for the prince and the princess, and they just want to see kind of like the singers and the celebrities. And we need them if we want to like solve this problem. And so by opening up the audience so widely, I think it's very smart and, and very effective to actually kind of like make this a much bigger topic that everyone gets to kind of like engage with. Um, and, and I mean, like he's, he's played a big role in us kind of like getting those, uh, those opportunities to bring that plat to the stadiums and like, yeah. again, like sports, a lot of people who will kind of like go to the stadium are not your kind of like eco warriors. Yeah. But if through the practice of kind of like, uh, like sport or going to kind of like, uh, like, uh, watch sport, you're doing part of the transition all of a sudden you've kind of like uh, played your role and yep. been educated. And I think that like the power of sport is huge for, yeah. for changing the mindset of the, the majority of people. Yeah. And of course, with the Earthshot Prize, it's like literally shot. The number of awards you've won is huge. And suddenly, <laughs> you know, you're all about the Earthshot Prize. So I know you've won like the Ellen MacArthur uh, one. And I, I know that there's many more. And there's so many accolades that have come your way. Does that make you worried as well that so many people are recognizing in you and you better deliver? Yeah, I mean, like pressure is on. And I think that that's one of the like people love a, a winning story, but like um, it and, and, and that's important to kind of like give some recognition to the things that are that are harder, that are not just kind of like taking off on their own. Um, but need a little bit of like support from 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 those prices to to get uh, going. Um, obviously, like um, until we like replace a billion single use plastics, we'll have had a very little impact in all yeah. of this. And also, we don't claim that seaweed is going to replace every piece of plastic in the world. Like we have some really great use case. We think that like for the like avoidable kind of like plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, we can use seaweed in, 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 in a much better way, but like there's lots of places where plastic is just having too high properties or is actually kind of like a really good material for that application as long as it doesn't end up in nature. Um, so we're, we're also kind of like trying to make sure that we are leaving space for all of the other solutions that are needed for us to really have um, like a range of solutions that are uh, right for each application. Um, but at the same time, I think that we also need to, yeah, like to have more of that intangible support for the things that are really hard to solve that otherwise no one is really kind of incentivized to solve. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it's very clever to create like prize awards, um, ceremonies, um, moments where it's going to be in the news, p people are going to talk about it because that also gets to shape a bit the culture and yeah. the discussion. Um, so yeah, I don't think that there's like uh, like uh, ever like too much of this, given that I mean we've got like uh, elections coming up in mm -hmm. quite a few different parts of the world, and unfortunately, I don't think that like sustainability is going it's to be kind of like one of the main uh, points to be to be kind of like creating the the right debate. We we both wish that that was <laughs> right in the center of it because that's a huge issue. But you're right; it's not. It's definitely not 
there with the Trump economics where yeah. I am. But <laughs> hopefully it is a little bit there with the Biden economics. So at least that's a good thing. So I'm seeing there's an evolution that I'm seeing as as you are growing as a company and you as an entrepreneur as well. And I see this year you're putting a lot more effort towards policy. So tell me more about that. And I know that, you know, you kind of looked at the Netherlands and, and did some work with the European uh, Union and how they are shaping. So what gets you to be, because of course, you know, all of us have limited time, but you are providing your time in that direction. So talk to me and us, uh, us as in the listeners, a little bit more about why that is important and why are you choosing to pay attention towards that? Yeah, well, I think that... Um policy has a huge power that is too kind of like often not used to really give the right certainty for change to happen. Like uh, yesterday, um, like I was uh, at a lunch with a lot of kind of like big investors and pretty much all of them were saying like, we're not going to make a move because there's too much uncertainty on policy. And it's like, we're leaving kind of like dry powder on the sideline for half a decade just because we don't have clear long-term policy and like uh, that's not money from the government that's money that like is from the like, the private market that is not being deployed <clears throat> so one of the things that we are conscious we need to do is like we have a platform we have a lot of visibility and we are showcasing a solution that is not just recycling not just reuse with plastic not just kind of like some of the old stuff we're trying to showcase that there are more innovative solutions to come and, and the number one thing that is frustrating is that like legislations tend to be written for kind of like solutions from the past. Um, there is very little space left for future innovations um, in terms of like categories and incentives and so on. So um, we're just trying to kind of like be around the table and have a chance to <clears throat> say um, what is important for fostering innovation. Um, and sometimes some legislations do kind of like get it right. And, um, have some really interesting concepts that do make a difference. Um, one of them in the Netherlands, as you were kind of like mentioning, has been the like the first application of the single use plastic directive of the European Union. Um, when the Dutch introduced a, a tax on plastic takeaway containers, um, like they had to actually check on the on the market which of those brands were putting uh, a plastic packaging on the market and which were not having plastic in their packaging. And so it was the first time that a government actually leaned in and did the job themselves of checking what was on the market, mm -hmm. this market review, um, instead of just trusting the industry yeah. to self-police. And what was really kind of like shocking out of this, uh, like th this market review is that um, they eventually kind of like, uh, after doing lots of tests, uh, validated that Notpla was indeed plastic free. Mm -hmm. um, but they actually also kind of like didn't find a single other solution that was plastic free. That's amazing. And with every every kind of like day solutions that like we stumble upon that like say plastic free, recyclable, compostable, all sorts of different claims, it really shows that like the industry has been completely kind of like unashamed of stretching reality, claiming whatever they wanted. They knew that there was zero kind of like consequences because the government was not checking. And as a result, we've been left with like a lot of greenwashing and no incentive for innovation. None of yeah. these companies ever had to kind of like think how are we going to replace our plastic because they could already claim that they were kind of like plastic free. And so um, by introducing this type of, uh, of definition of plastic, this time, this type of kind of like uh, tax, it actually creates a bit of a differentiation, which is really important because nowadays, like even way beyond kind of like the Netherlands, people are really starting to be like, okay, so maybe I, I should check what the, gov the Dutch government uh, thought about this brand or this brand. Did it contain plastic or not? Someone has actually done the job and that is kind of like something that is very important. Yeah, and that includes like the PLA manufacturers Correct. and all of that. So you, so what they found was that even they were blending and compounding with some plasticizers. So the the, the European Union um, introduced this uh, single use plastic directive in 2019, and for the first time, um, there was a very clear and simple definition of what a plastic polymer is, okay. and also what is what a natural polymer 
Yes. And so basically, like to make the difference between the, the plastic polymers and the non-plastic polymers, there's two criteria. The first one is the concept that like polymerization has to happen in nature. So uh, you're not kind of like making kind of like uh, tanks where you build your materials yeah. from kind of like monomers, yeah. including fermenting, yeah. but like yeah. mostly targeted at like just kind of like synthetic polymers uh, that are made from, from scratch, from petroleum and, and other kind of like sources. And then the second one uh, is that even if you take your polymer uh, from nature, then you're not allowed to chemically modify it. So you can't change the polymer chemistry beyond what is already available in nature. That's pretty and straight. That's pretty straight. And that creates this category of non-chemically modified natural polymers equals not plastic uh. polymers. And basically that legislation just said like plastic, whether it's a bioplastic, a biodegradable plastic, yeah. it doesn't really it's matter, still... it's plastic. Yeah. And then those uh, polymers, like for example, cellulose, it's a polymer that like, yeah. actually grows in trees, lignin as well. And then there's like hundreds and hundreds of other polymers that are naturally occurring in nature. Those are not plastic. Okay. And basically like the Dutch, for the first time, they had to check which packaging contain plastic or not plastic. So they don't even think, even if it kind of biodegrades or composts, it doesn't matter. It's still plastic. Yeah, it could still be plastic. So Absolutely. that's not what. But and what is motivating them for that? Because isn't the ultimately, it could be a PBS, a PBS or PBAT. Correct. And of course, we, let's just parking the source uh, source aside, uh, but it'll compost. So so, isn't that what is more important? How do they see it? So, and this is where like. I'm not the EU and like yeah. there's a lot of debates on like how um, like the direction of travel is. Do we wish you were? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like whether kind of like there is more support for recycling or more support for composting or more support for whatever it is. But like the principle uh, that guided the, the this definition of the European Union was to say um, like, like it, it was by kind of like the precaution principle. If a material is not already abundant in nature, let's not allow ourselves to dump kind of like hundreds of thousands of tons of that material in nature yeah. because it might create yeah. some kind of problem. And so chemical modification means that it could be kind of like uh, different. It is an extreme kind of like uh, high bar definition. And I think that like there are many materials that are biodegradable, but not kind of like natural that have a role to play. There are some materials that are synthetic that have a role to play, yeah. but what the EU said is like, those will be called plastic and the ones that are not plastic will not be called plastic because nature already has like hundreds of thousands of tons of these everywhere in the natural environment. And those should be the ones that we use. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. So I think that makes me very happy. We have to combine our materials, cellulose yeah. and, exactly, <laughs> and exactly. you know, which you're already doing and, you know, those both are natural, um, natural resources so so i hope that we can kind of do that as we go forward okay so let's let's take it towards uh, closure because we can talk endlessly mm -hmm. we know that uh, so what about uh, as you're building not it's growing from a team of two to you know i don't know how many you are and you can mention that and how are you building the culture so that so that you know your company keeps innovating and goes beyond us right we, we want the company to keep thriving how do you see that piece and what would your advice be to budding entrepreneurs about culture yeah culture is super important it's also super hard especially when you're kind of like beyond just uh, kind of like the core team culture is what other people in the team will kind of like do within kind of like their own kind of like groups and so on so it's 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 really important and really key to have a chance of uh, basically kind of like influencing this in the right way to start with. Um, we are lucky that we have like a really great group of people uh, in Notpla who've really kind of like been the champion of this. Um, and we try to drive culture with values mm -hmm. and we do a lot of work on our values to make sure that we actually are kind of like using them in day to day and, and, and those are informing how we do things. So. Uh, for example, you're talk, talking about like innovation. Uh, one of our value is like we're trailblazers. So we're really not afraid of taking risk. It's kind of like going first through kind of like a, a challenge um, or kind of like um, doing it differently. Uh, but another kind of like value um, is like make it happen. Like we don't have all day, like 
there's urgency to act. We need to make things yeah. happen quickly and it needs to be a, a real kind of like real solution for like, uh, for, for, for society. So it can't be something that is going to be incredibly expensive or very hard to implement. It needs to be actually kind of like working. So through some of these things, we, we actually kind of like, uh, like shape a bit how the teams work together, what kind of interactions they have, and therefore as a result, what the culture ends up being. Yeah, amazing. Because I'm sure, I was sure before that I'm sure you're actively thinking about that mm -hmm. and building it consciously. Okay, my last two. So, so in an ideal world, say in the next five years, what would you like the scale to be for Notpla or these applications that you're doing in terms of maybe number of tons or any other parameter that you have? How do you see it? What's your dream? Yeah, I think, I mean, like if we can hit the, the billion single use plastics replaced, yeah. that would be really exciting. Um, there's going to be a lot of work to get there. Um, but I think in terms of scale as, as a company, I don't think that we need to be kind of like really big to actually work very efficiently with the rest of the, of, of the value chain. We're not here to steal anyone's job. We want to work with like, uh, the converters and distributors and the seaweed industry and like, uh, all of the different kind of like, uh, clients that end up using those products. We want everyone to kind of like feel that they can do a better choice of material, but it doesn't require them to completely transform how they're doing things. Um, so, so yeah, I think, um, my hope is that the portfolio continues to grow. Um, and like we're now working on like rigid applications. Um, hopefully we can bring more and more kind of like solutions. Um, and I think that, um, we like to say we're a bit like the Tetra pack of sustainable packaging. So if not, Pla, uh, gets, uh, as widely recognized as Tetra pack, I think we'll, we'll that's have a pretty good, good <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good size, <laughs> you know, some, whatever, $15 billion exactly. or something <laughs> like that. Uh, okay. My last one, what does good garbage mean for you? Well, it's interesting cause like there's no waste in nature, right? So I think that, um, like garbage should really no, not exist. Uh, but like, because humans are so kind of like wasteful, we are kind of like seeing, um, output of any process as potential garbage. I think the great thing is if you can make this part of the natural environment, it will never be garbage for nature. It might be garbage for humans, but it might not be garbage for nature. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Pierre. Thank no you for worries. this. Well, first of all, you know, thank you for inviting us in so that we could do it in this person. I think this is such a great idea. I'm going to see how we can do more yeah, of hopefully. this. And more than that, of course, thank you for your work, your purpose, your passion that you're bringing to the industry and really being a trailblazer for that. I salute you for that. Thank you so much thank for being so on much. the show. Cheers. <laughs>